Welcome to this monster of a ranking list. Mortal Kombat is my favourite fighting game series and it's simply down to the intricate lore and incredible roster of fighters which keeps me returning to every instalment. This is a celebration of those characters. So without further ado, I'm going to be ranking for you today every single playable fighter from the Mortal Kombat series. That's including guest fighters, which I'll be looking at from the perspective of someone who lives in a world where only their Mortal Kombat versions exist, to kind of keep the list fun and fair. Characters will be ranked based on their weight in the Mortal Kombat lore, their designs, movesets and fatalities. Just before we start, remember this list is completely for entertainment. This is not based on definitive fact. Your list will be a lot different to my list. But regardless, let Mortal Kombat begin. It's one thing being a bad character, it's another when even your creators dislike you. Su Hao sits at his rightful spot in a number 99 and last place. Being nothing more than yet another Kano inspired villain with zero personality, a Mongolian stereotype and even gets killed off in his own ending. When Eren Black brings his decapitated head in MK11 with him, it serves as a reminder of the shame the franchise has for birthing Su Hao. Jax eventually caught up with Su Hao and ripped the implant from his chest in retribution. Jarek is another Kano copycat street level bad guy. He is what happens when you don't bring back Kano, but fans want Kano so much that you create a generic character and paste Kano's moveset on top. He's not as big an insult as Su Hao, but certainly is one of the most forgettable and blandest characters in the series. Thankfully Jack's off this guy in the game he first appeared in. Not much better than Jarek is number 97's Cobra, being a knockoff of Street Fighter's Ken and having barely any relevance in the series. The only thing that keeps him interesting is. oh wait, nothing. These were the guards I was sent to dispose of? Fah! Another forgettable character from MK's past is Dairu, with nothing noteworthy to say about his character, his design or his shallow moveset. He's best left in the past. Kai suffers a similar fate as Dairo, but has some likeability to him at the very least. Still, he is just another Shaolin monk fighter like Kung Lao and Liu Kang, but lacking their flair, charisma, moveset and memorability. Thank you, Raiden. I will not fail. Meat is an example of when you run out of ideas for secret characters. He's just a red muscle skeleton. Armageddon may have given him some background, and he's charming in a very weird way, being able to tear off his own head, but otherwise, he's just kind of a mistake. Mocap is only slightly more memorable than Meat. Mocap is the motion capture guy and in lore, a friend of Johnny Cage. But aside from the comedy of his ball suit, he has no more personality or interesting features. Moloch. Moloch was the Goro sub-boss of MK5 and he didn't become playable till Armageddon. He's sluggish, unappealing to look at and play, and quite confusing what his design is meant to represent. It's a good job he's powerful, else he'd be at the bottom of this list. Taven. Taven may have been the main protagonist of his debut game, but he still lacked a memorable design, moveset and personality. Dagon, being the brother of Taven, kind of suffers from the same problems. That being said, Dagon did turn to the dark side and start up the Red Dragon organization, which is more than what Taven added to Mortal Kombat. While not much better than a love interest Cobra, Kira at the very least has more entertaining movesets and endings for her appearances, but one of the weaker female combatants in the series with moves borrowed from other fighters. Yeah. 
What do you do when you've pretty much made a ninja out of every colour of the rainbow? You make a ninja with of every colour of the rainbow. That's the idea behind Chameleon. While he has the best moveset on this list so far, he lacks in potential and background, never breaking out of his gimmicky mould like the other ninjas. Chameleon, with a K, the female one, is more of a male counterpart, but at least she was given some background. But being exclusive to Nintendo versions of only two Mortal Kombat games, her character has never flourished more beyond being system exclusive content. Raiko had all the potential to be a substantial character, but unfortunately he was introduced in one of the more uninspired Mortal Kombat entries, and he's since faded into obscurity. Supposed to be Shinnok's general, he didn't even show in Mortal Kombat 10. When it comes down to power, no other character on this list can top Blaze, Armageddon given form. Originally just a small fiery sprite in the background of MK2, this guy became playable in MK5 as a default model with fire effects on it, and then he transformed into the hulking boss we see in Armageddon. While he certainly has a presence, he's not the best character to play and has zero personality. Centaur Motaro is certainly one of the more cooler boss monsters of the series. Well, he was until they butchered him in Armageddon, literally. At 83 is Darius, yet another character burst from the Order Realm vs Chaos Realm plotline. This guy felt like Wesley Snipes snuck into Mortal Kombat, and has an interesting moveset. Besides that slight charm, however, he's yet another forgettable character. Darkseid. Out of all the new characters introduced in MK8, Darkseid is the one that got the least treatment. The supposed big bad of the DC universe, Darkseid is given zero character in the story mode, becomes locked in the nether realm, and to play, he's a simplistic boss character with zero fatalities. Being yet another muscle-bound sub-boss styled character, Ferator stands out from the previous entries through its symbiotic character trait. A 2-in-1 allows Ferator to at least be memorable and very cool to watch. Still, it doesn't make them much enjoyable to play, and they didn't make the cut for MK11 for good reason. While he may look like meat with a mask on, Dramin has a really interesting background that he was once the Warlord of Outworld before Shao Kahn and even Onaga. However, this strong foundation falls apart with a rather lacklustre moveset and really irritating flies that hang around him like feces. Certainly one of the most underdeveloped characters in Mortal Kombat. Lex Luthor MK8 didn't do a great job at developing its villains. It's hard to fill in the boots of Shang Tsung and Quan Chi. Lex Luthor just didn't have the gravitas as those other villains, and thus became yet another forgettable cyborg fighter. The positives I can say about Shujinko are you grow together in Deception Story Mode, giving you an attachment to him, and his moveset is OP as hell, and after playing the whole campaign, you'll be able to take on anyone as Shujinko. Then you realise he awakens the Dragon King Onaga, and he basically destroys the franchise. And is he really that original? No, he's the most generic looking old master in a series that already has plenty, and his moveset legit is picked apart from other characters with nothing unique of its own. Cassie beats up the old master, so it's okay. The issue with Lee Mei is she just out of her depth with all the other female combatants. I like to play as her, but ranking her amongst the rest and she's barely memorable. Skimpy ninja clothing, purple attire, yeah there's already a much more interesting character with the same getup. MKX turned Lee Mei into a basic NPC which felt like the final nail in her coffin. 
While I play as Hotaru less than some previous fighters because of his more watered down moveset, he does have a much more unique design. I certainly love his exoskeleton like armour and decorative flags. Hotaru is the guy who stands for order and does so by aligning with the Dragon King Onaga. If he came back and was more fleshed out, it'd be a lot higher on the list. You take us to the Khan, I'll tell him you took us down. Maybe you get a bonus. You can't lose. At the end of the day, this list boils down to my perspective of the characters, and Kung Jin was one of my least favourites to play in MK10. He has an interesting arc in the campaign, and that's his saving grace. However, it doesn't surprise me that he didn't make the cut for MK11. Take me with you. I've waited an eternity to escape. Much like Lee Mei, Serena is another forgotten fighter lost in the sea of much more memorable female combatants. Her single playable appearance in the main series certainly damages her history. That being said, she has so much potential and I was fairly fond of some of her moves. You'd mistake Ashra for being a female Raiden, and rightly so, with her similar white attire and thunder and spin attacks. She had the potential to be an interesting character, and she had the moveset to go with that, but she stuck as a minor character and in Raiden's shadow. Deathstroke, how's it going? Yeah, it's been a while. I got all the money for you. It's, 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 no, 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 please! I got the money! Ah! A step up from Luthor due to his more striking design is MK8's Deathstroke. This one really had the potential to be much greater, but the story mode has nothing for him to do outside of be a street level supervillain. His moveset is like Striker meets Scorpion. Mortal Kombat Armageddon lets you create your own custom fighter, using a multitude of assets from other fighters. For its time, it was certainly a cool feature and had plenty of options. Unfortunately, you can't do much with the fighter outside of local one-on-one -on -one matches and can't give them any fatalities because Armageddon. The creator fighter hasn't returned since. Tanya is one of Mortal Kombat's least interesting female ninjas, a one-dimensional villain bent on betraying everyone, including her supposed allies. She ranks above Chameleon simply because her moveset in MK10 is much better than playing Armageddon on the Wii. One of the more distinctive characters coming out of the 3D era of Mortal Kombat, Vampire Nitara has a really unique character design, a gothic bat lady, and has a good motive for entering Mortal Kombat, to free her native land from Shao Kahn's control. However, this doesn't stop her character from feeling underdeveloped and underutilised. Talking about underutilised characters, out of MK8's new superhero themed fighters, Green Lantern I felt was the most undercooked of the lot. Not only does he have a smaller than usual selection of special moves, but his big gimmick, a ring that allows him to summon anything he can imagine into existence, and yet the majority of his moveset is just hammers and the occasional wall. The first of two Whip Ladies introduced in MK8, Wonder Woman is a fun character to play as, but rather forgettable as MK8 just doesn't do enough to make her stand out from the other women of Mortal Kombat. Wonder Woman's dazzling but slim selection of moves is held up by a great backstory. The Collector is my least favourite of the new characters introduced in MK11. Collector is another lackey of Shao Kahn's. He collects items from his foes, that's his gimmick. And he looks like a version of Goro that needs to eat a sandwich. Yeah, he's definitely an intriguing new character with a glorious team of animators behind him. But if he didn't return in the next game, I'd probably forget about his entire existence. Mavado started off as a character with potential. He was the leader of the Red Dragon Clan, rival to Kano and even massacred Cabal, stealing his upblades. Mavado even had a good design and a not too bad moveset involving these ropes he uses. But then one game later in Deception, the Red Dragon is forgotten, Mavado is butchered, and in Armageddon, well, Cabal is back and he's just so much more interesting. The rest is history, but if he did make a comeback, I'd be up for it. 
Raichou. Being the master to two of the series' strongest warriors, Liu Kang and Kung Lao, Bo Cho had a lot to live up to. However, his introduction was less than appealing. Some overweight drunk dude who farts and pukes on his foes. How did he train Liu Kang? That being said, since his new inclusion in MK10, I have grown rather fond of the character, and he slightly reminds me of one of my favourite Jackie Chan films, Drunken Master. That's a plus in my books. To me, Reptile is the well-hidden and truly mysterious secret boss from MK1 that only got worse after. Turning this guy into a literal reptile destroyed all of the mystery and intrigue about what was under the mask. Not only that, but he does become a simple lackey for the forces of evil. If it weren't for his subpar fighting style and moveset and his legendary first appearance, Reptile would have been closer to the bottom. Curtis Stryker was introduced in MK3 as a New York riot control officer. In other words, a lollipop man. And that's about as much story as he's given. But seriously, this is a character that's fun to admire, but for a list of the best MK characters, he was one of the lamest of the lot. MK9 redeemed him, but he's still one of my least played characters in the few games that he appears. Speaking about cops, Robocop, introduced into MK11, is pretty much Striker, but with an even more varied moveset and like he was put through Lin Kuei's cyber programming. I find Robocop a little stiff to play, but I do like his arsenal of weapons and abilities, and he's very iconic looking. If anyone could beat Robocop's arsenal of gadgets and weaponry, it would have to be MK10's Triborg, a random Lin Kuei drone that has Cyrax, Sectors, Smokes and Cyber Sub-Zero's movesets uploaded into its programming. It certainly makes for a fun character and an intimidating opponent. However, Triborg has almost no backstory, character, identity of its own, involvement in the series, and even its variations are just those other, way more interesting characters. Triborg was simply a cheaper way of including the main cyborgs into MK10. I think out of all of these 99 characters, Cetrion is the one I've clocked in the least amount of time playing, and I think it's because she's just not very appealing to me. I don't know if anyone else feels similar. That being said, I position her at 59th spot because I do like her background, her being the god of virtue and yet only seems to bring about sociopathic destruction. I think it's her ties to elemental powers which so many other characters in this series already share that brings her down for me. Yet her mother, Kronika, an unplayable boss, has a much stronger foundation for her moveset. If Cetrion was the same character but played like her mother instead, I think then I'd be on board. Kintaro. The awesome looking Shokan warrior Kintaro sits at 58th spot, and while he's most definitely a cool looking character, in terms of being playable, the creators haven't treated him nearly as well as Goro or Shiva. Kintaro needs an updated appearance, as right now he's playable in only two MK games on console, and both are shallow and cheap boss monster appearances. Give Kintaro some more love. Naga. Being able to play as Onaga, the Dragon King in MK7 was certainly an exciting moment. This huge beast is second only to Shao Kahn for being the most intimidating character in the series. He took the might of Raiden, Quan Chi and Shang Tsung like it was nothing. To play, however, is another story. See, the boss characters in Armageddon are sluggish, unbalanced and fun to play simply because of how cheap they are. Onaga, however, definitely needs to return in a future Mortal Kombat. Onaga wins. Your death will satisfy my rage. 
Tremor first made his mark in one of the franchise's worst excuses for a video game, Mortal Kombat Special Forces, but he didn't become officially playable until Mortal Kombat 10. Tremor is the brown clad ninja with powers over earthquakes, rock, etc. This certainly makes for a gimmicky but entertaining fighting style. It's a shame however he bears any involvement in the plot to the game, nor do his variations stand out much from one another. Catwoman. Catwoman is the second female combatant introduced in MK8 to wield a whip. Catwoman's more agile moveset and cat-like attacks make her more fun to play than Wonder Woman. Both have little to offer the story of MK8, however. The Flash. The Flash, also introduced in MK8, is like a heroic cabal, just without the backstory and hook blades. Having a moveset centered on his superhuman speed is an example of another pretty basic feeling gimmick character. Thankfully, the Flash is still really fun to play as. Captain Marvel. Continuing the trend of gimmick based superhero fighters, Captain Marvel certainly goes deeper than previous entries on this list. Calling out Shazam when he summons his power, Captain Marvel had more of an integral part of MK8's plot and a varied moveset, but his power can't be shaken that it felt like a more held back version of Raiden's. Maybe if we saw Captain Marvel return, his moveset could be deepened. Shinnok should have been higher on this list, being the next big bad after Shao Kahn, the evil elder god and rival to Lord Raiden himself. Instead he came out looking like an Emperor Palpatine's undead cousin and he manages to get his ass kicked in the two games that build him up, the latter of which was by newcomer Special Forces rookie Cassie Cage. Thankfully he's saved by having a rather fun fighting style involving his giant skeletal hands, but ender of worlds, this guy isn't. The insectoid Devora sits at 51st spot. She was a fun new character for MK10, aligned with Outworld's new ruler Kotal Khan. However, she eventually devolves into another backstabbing baddie when she reveals she's been a lackey of Shinnok all along. And while she does kill Melina in a rather poetic way, her movesets never really enticed me and honestly when I came back to MK11 to do this video, I was actually surprised that she was in the game as I completely forgot about that. Leatherface. The skin-wearing villain of Mortal Kombat X, Leatherface, is one of the game's most standout fighters due to him not being some martial arts master, cyborg assassin, advanced alien species, or monstrous outwilder. It's just an insane serial killer with a chainsaw, and he has some really over-the-top combos and special moves. It's a shame, however, that his variations don't offer much to differentiate themselves from one another and the moves that they cut out into the other variations could have worked better had they all been a part of a single moveset. Still, Leatherface was a fun addition in MK10. Kratos. A Spartan out for revenge, Kratos is one of the more unique of the MK9 combatants, the whole Greek mythology wrapped into one character. While he can be slow and lumbering to play, once you get a grasp of his moveset which consists of long range and short range offensive moves and even some QTE events, he can be a visual delight to play. Out of just the original seven combatants of Mortal Kombat, Sonya always felt the most bland and uninteresting in each game she appeared, constantly pushed to the background or being the forgettable army general with tough attitude stereotype. What strengthens her character is her relationships with much more interesting people, Jax, Johnny Cage, Cassie Cage and Kano, and she does have a brilliant moveset behind her, I'll give her that. The malevolent spirit of the dream realm, Freddy Krueger, is one of my favourites of MK9's DLC characters. He brought a whole new side to the Mortal Kombat series with his horror style and bladed gloves from which he can tear through reality. He's not the most versatile of fighters, but is certainly enjoyable to play as.
a nearly indestructible killing machine sent from the future. The Terminator stands at position of 46. He is a powerhouse, utilising a mix of grabs and high kicks, and dealing extra damage with his trusty lever action shotgun. Certainly an intimidating opponent, the Terminator feels the envy of the Lin Kuei Cyber Ninjas. Having a fairly forgettable introduction as Jax Briggs' daughter, Jackie Briggs eventually became her own in her second appearance. What also helped her character is very fun moveset inspired by her father's fighting style and metal arms, but thankfully has just enough of her own spin to it to make her stand out. Jackie was injected with creativity and was deepened thanks to MK11, and I think it would have been great for her if she became a mainstay for the series. Superman. Superman feels and resembles a more intriguing and varied version of Captain Marvel. Instead of just transforming Raiden's moveset, Superman has bits of a variety of characters. He can freeze enemies, fire a laser beam, fly, and cause a lot of destruction. Superman is the epitome of a superhero fighter, and has all the powers to go with it. Superman is without a doubt one of MK8's most interesting new combatants. Jax, the character with the metal arms. Since his metalless introduction in MK2, he's appeared in nearly every Mortal Kombat since, and yet his character still wasn't all that deep until Mortal Kombat 10. For the longest time, he was Sonya's partner in the Special Forces, the army boxer who had arms of steel, literally. He definitely has a fun moveset, but he never really feels like he's evolved throughout the series, until of course till MKX actually gave him some depth, showing us a retired Jax after his time that he became a revenant. MK11 showed us the older Jax alongside his younger self, and this helped give him more dimension as a character, and gets him a few spots up on this list. <laughs> Baraka, I feel, gets a bit of bad press for being the jobber of Mortal Kombat, due to him being so indistinguishable from the rest of the Tarkatan warriors. But before the MK games introduced more and more standout monsters, Baraka was one of the most frightening in MK2 and 3. He stood out with his razor sharp teeth and huge claws that extend from his arms. Over time, he did become the pawn for the Outworld forces, but his reappearance in MK11 definitely helped in defining him for a new generation. Descendant of the great MK champion of the same name, Kung Lao falls into the shadow of his friend and ally Liu Kang. Thankfully, unlike Kai, who had similar issues, Kung Lao has a stylish moveset and a fun gimmick, a razor-sharp hat that does whatever Kung Lao commands, and offers some great fatalities. Kung Lao and Liu Kang's friendly rivalry would also birth the side game Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks, and for that, I'm grateful for his character. <laughs> Nightwolf shoots up to this spot on the list thanks to his more recent appearance in MK11 Aftermath. For a long time, Nightwolf's entire persona was centred around being the Native American fighter, with next to no more character development or evolution. Thankfully, MK9 redeemed the character, having him be the one to sacrifice himself to take down Sindel. Unfortunately, even this backfired, placing him back as a background grunt. In Aftermath, he had a much stronger role in the MK universe, and his appearance, attire, and moveset in MK11 has so much depth, making full use of his Native American lineage. His archaic green energy weapons certainly had come a long way. Sector and the Cyber Ninjas of MK3 were fun new takes on the Scorpion and Sub-Zero of the first two games. They displayed the more urban setting 3 was headed. Sector was the red Cyber Ninja, and pretty interchangeable outside of the explosives he used. Later games held more backstory for Sector, showing he was one of the few cyborg ninjas that didn't need programming because he was so up for becoming a robotic killing machine. 
He would even go on to start his own offshoot from the Lin Kuei in order to find more would-be cyber assassins. It's unfortunate, however, Sector has never really broke away from the cyber initiative and being the other side of the coin to Cyrax. Being not much more than an extension of Kronika's will, her henchman Geras doesn't really break out of the loyal soldier mould in his MK11 introduction, but I feel this works for the character, it makes his time bending powers more tragic when you realise he's trapped in time himself. One of his alternate costumes being Frankenstein's monster, much like he's the monster of Kronika's creation. His sand-based powers and design make for a really interesting new character in the series that I hold out hope he'll return in a sequel. For the longest time, Sindel didn't account to much besides being Shao Kahn's queen. MK9 turned her into a powerful killing machine, and then in MK11 Aftermath, she was brought back and turned out she loved being Shao Kahn's murder queen. An obvious but still fun twist for the villainous character. She also has a creative moveset, mixing her hair attacks with Banshee screams. Takeda feels like the frost to Scorpion's Shirai Ryu, Scorpion's prized pupil and son of Kenshi. Takeda was one of my favourites of the new characters introduced in MK10. His dual whip attacks and pulse blades offer a mix of Scorpion's versatility with the Cyber Ninja's technology, but you can't help but not see this guy as just a pupil of Scorpion's. Takeda definitely was in need of returning in MK11, but regardless, Takeda is still a great new addition to the cast of Mortal Kombat. Attacks. Another great addition to the MK10 cast was Predator, an alien hunter which specialised in a broad moveset across its three variations, which utilised traps and guerrilla warfare with high-tech plasma weaponry and throwable blades. His legendary style, fantastic sound design and fun moveset made for a grand new addition to the roster. While being the interchangeable yellow cyber ninja in MK3, Cyrax got a lot more development than Sector did. It turns out Cyrax wasn't too keen on becoming a cyber ninja in the first place. In fact, he resented it, and this makes it all the more devastating when we see Cyrax as a reprogrammed deathbot. Jax and Sonya would eventually rescue him, and he would become a part of Special Forces. But in recent entries, Cyrax and Sector have gone back to feeling fairly interchangeable once again. Jade is one of the more memorable female characters to play. She has a glorious moveset in almost all of her appearances, but unfortunately the series never really went anywhere with her character, constantly stuck as Katana's friend or the green-clad ninja with a stick. It wouldn't be until Mortal Kombat 11 when Jade would get some of her limelight that she deserved in her relationship with Kotal Khan, and this certainly pushed her up a few spots on the list. Plus, I love her new redesign. It's a shame, however, this would feel a little too late in the series. Out of the entire MK cast, Jason is one of the most menacing of them all. Standing tall, not speaking a word, wearing a hockey mask in contrast to the multiple masked ninjas of the series, and having a move in which he can rise back from the dead. Jason comes with three variations that all offer something different for the player. His movesets make great use of high power kicks, grabs and a machete. All I could wish more is for some more memorable fatalities from this monstrous character. Alien was a beast of a fighter when it first came to Mortal Kombat 10, a versatile fighter with a broad moveset consisting of various blade attacks and acid throws. Alien is a menacing monster, being a parasitic extraterrestrial that had birthed from a Tarkatan host, as to why it shares similar moves from Baraka. But in addition, Alien has a few tricks from Reptile's acid refluxes and even utilises its long pincer-like tail into its moveset. 
Its fatality has a queen alien destroy your opponent. Or you can leave executing your fatality and instead watch as your opponent becomes a host themselves. Unsettling, powerful and birthed like a weaponized monster, the alien certainly earns this spot on the list. Smoke is one of my top tier ninjas in the franchise. He's not only higher because he's so underused. His last proper playable appearance was in MK9. Before that game, he was just a mere background character, besides his duo team up with Noob in MK6. Smoke's moveset of controlling clouds of gas, using it to teleport himself and others, is great on paper, and great for his few appearances, but just hasn't been fully developed as some other ninja's powers in the series. Smoke is well in need of a comeback. You know the team gave no dams when they created Rain, the purple ninja. That is not only a joke, but you can tell the devs had a lot of fun designing this character's moves and fatalities. Rain has had a slow beginning however, being solely a character, much like Tanya, that loves to backstab everyone he allies with. MK7 and 9 introduces him as the son of the Adenian god Argus. This propelled his ego into outer space, but only helped in excelling his character further. He was the only NPC character in MK10 that I personally was gutted didn't show in the roster. Thankfully MK11 brought him back for one more outing and he was the best he had ever been. I think Havoc to be the most underrated character in the franchise. It's a shame that the Order Realm vs Chaos Realm plot from MK6 never caught on because it lost one of the more unique villains in the series. Havoc is the poster boy for the Chaos Realm, and everything he does is to simply cause more chaos, like how he wants Shao Kahn to stay as Emperor of Outworld for the simple fact that Shao Kahn causes corruption, which feeds Havoc's nature. Not only that, but Deception did a decent job with Havoc as a fighter, Havoc being easily the most standout new character from MK6, being able to snap his limbs back. Havoc is in serious need of a reappearance in the next Mortal Kombat game. <laughs> Arguably one of the more respectable enemies in Mortal Kombat, Shiva has been well represented in almost all of her appearances and her reappearance in MK11 Aftermath, only further enhanced her character. She is gracefully animated, has a fantastic new design in each game that she appears, MK11 Shiva is only second to being my favourite monster character to play as, and as a final word for Shiva, she's flipping badass. So the funny thing is, Fujin was a character I didn't really have an opinion on. He first appeared in MK4, which I didn't really care for, and he kind of just fell into the background in MK7's huge roster. But his recent appearance in MK11 blasted him all the way to near top spot for me. Breaking away from Raiden's side, Fujin isn't a character bound by his gimmick. That's what I like. Yeah, he's a wind god with awesome wind based powers, but he's also got an appealing personality serving as a beacon of hope for humanity, where Raiden is easily turned to evil. He also has more in his arsenal than just wind, carrying with him a sword and even a crossbow. Fujin is without a doubt one of the MK11's strongest overall characters for his depth, personality, style, moveset and charm. More Fujin in the future, please. Simply put, Scarlet is one of the most fun Mortal Kombat characters introduced in the reboot trilogy. She is the female equivalent to Ermac, she is the red palette swap ninja and loyal to Shao Kahn. But where Ermac had control over souls, Scarlet can manipulate blood, tearing it from her foes and morphing it into any shape she can imagine. And Scarlet is one of the few MK characters where the talented team at Netherrealm didn't hold back in displaying her powers in really creative ways. She's a delight to watch and play. Just wish she had more story. 
Female Sub-Zero Frost has one of my favourite character arcs in the series. Introducing MK5 as an apprentice of Sub-Zero's, her self-centred attitude and lust for power soon sent her on a tragic downfall. Becoming obsessed with power, she disagreed with the newfound peace between Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Eventually she fell into her own insanity by becoming the latest cyborg ninja. Frost is backed up by a moveset that only closely resembles her former master, but giving her enough room of her own and her appearance in MK11 certainly helps cement her as a memorable character. Cabal is a guy who has gone through hell. Beginning as a rookie cop, he has since been burned alive, dragged through shady organisations and given super speedy powers. With his super speed and unique hook blades until Movado stole them, Cabal makes for a really charismatic and fun anti-hero with a striking design. That piece of gum you can never get off the bottom of your soul as you try to scratch it off, that's Kano, the wretched scum of the Mortal Kombat universe that can never seem to go away. A criminal with so much over the top personality that it just works for Mortal Kombat. A moveset so perfect for his slimy nature and being the original laser firing cyborg of the franchise makes him all the more important. I don't have time for this nonsense. My favourite of MK8's new superhero characters has to be Batman, given a superb moveset that is more than just a gimmicky superpower. Batman is a master in every form of martial art, has a strong sense of justice, being the sole hero to make an effort in figuring out why another dimension was colliding with his, and causing fellow superheroes to become enraged. And he's equipped with a multi-million dollar arsenal of gadgets and weaponry such as smoke bombs and batarangs. MK8 even has him as the rival to Scorpion, and he certainly was. Cassie Cage is my favourite of the new Special Forces recruits in MK10. The daughter of Sonya Blade and Johnny Cage, Cassie is bursting with personality. She shares her mother's strong leadership and military combat style, but keeps it light-hearted with borrowing her father's sense of humour, signing autographs, taking selfies with her enemies, even posting about her battles online, all makes her one of the more highlights of the two games that she appears. It's a bit far-fetched how she was able to completely destroy the Elder God Shinnok in her first appearance, but she is still an enjoyable character and Netherrealm evidently had a lot of fun making her. <laughs> the single new character from MK8 that actually came back and for good reason, the Joker, is one of the most unique characters to come out of MK8 a villain twisted into causing destruction for the simple fact that he enjoys it. He dresses up in colourful suits, he carries with him a bag of joke shop tricks and gags, and the developers at Netherrealm and Midway managed to mould that into a brilliant moveset that no other character could pull off as well as the Joker. His style, his charisma, his insane charm and his maniacal laugh are all what build his character. Vietnam veteran and former Special Forces soldier John Rambo manages to outrank both Sonya and Jax on this list for the fact that I don't see him as a gimmicky character. He's not some guy with big metal arms, he's instead a highly trained war veteran and comes equipped with an arsenal of firepower and the skills, the traps and the tactics he had used in Vietnam. Going prone, eating a bug to restore health or using Claymores on his opponent, Rambo was a superbly detailed character and has a fantastic ending in his tower which felt like we had a full character arc with Rambo in his one appearance. Kotal Khan was close to being even higher on the list. I love what Kotal represents. Why does every Outworld Emperor need to be full-blown evil beasts? Kotal Khan is a strong leader, while he may behead the smallest of petty thieves, he has still that sense of honour, reasoning and does a lot to protect his kingdom. Kotal is also one of the more standout fighting game characters, with his design and moveset centred around the Mayan God of War. 
I hope his death in MK11 Aftermath doesn't signal the end of Kotal Khan in the future. Mortal Kombat owes a lot of its success to this next beast, one of the best mini-bosses in history, there was nothing mini about this four-armed Shokan Prince that stood out from the other fighters of Mortal Kombat due to his claymation digitised design. Goro was the first monstrous character in the series, winner of nine consecutive Mortal Kombat tournaments, besting the great Kung Lao himself. Annie is still one of the most intimidating fighters in all of Mortal Kombat. It can't be denied that MK7 dropped the ball with some of its boss fighters, giving Goro a bland moveset with four breasts. Thankfully, MK10 brought this guy back with full force, an award winning design, a fantastic set of variations, and some great fatalities. Eren Black could have easily eroded away after his first appearance as being the forgettable cowboy stereotype. It's thanks to Netherrealm's choice to make Eren Black a cold-hearted and eerie mercenary that he actually ends up being one of the more memorable characters. A colourful Clint Eastwood knockoff this guy isn't. Eren Black was taken to Outworld by Tarkatans, killed them all, and decided to stay in the realm as a gun for hire. He uses 19th century weaponry such as rifles and revolvers, he even has a sword fashioned out of a Tarkatan's arm. Eren Black's style, his attitude, his firepower, his special moves and his fatalities highlight him as one of MK10's greatest new fighters. Some good did come out of the 3D era of Mortal Kombat. Without them, we wouldn't have Kenshi, the character that can easily stand against the series most iconic characters. Kenshi is a blind ninja, out to hunt down Shang Tsung, has powers of psychokinesis and is an honourable fighter, kneeling before his defeated opponent. There's no denying that the blind swordsman is one of the most unique on the roster and is a delight to play. The mysterious Red Ninja who've made his first appearance as a joke character in Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, but his backstory will be defined in Mortal Kombat Trilogy. Ermac is the vessel for all the souls Shao Kahn has collected over the years. Even Kitana's father is a part of Ermac, and thus Ermac has brief moments of being an ally. Ermac is one of the few characters that got a ton of development over the years, quickly becoming more than just a red palette swap ninja, and turning into a mummy styled telekinetic anti hero. Ermac's exclusion from MK11 is a huge shame, as there could have been a lot of potential for the character. In the world of Mortal Kombat, there's no other being that is the embodiment of pure and utter evil than Quan Chi. He manipulated Sub-Zero, destroyed Scorpion's family and clan, became one half of the Deadly Alliance, and has awoke the Elder God Shinnok multiple times. Quan Chi's iconic design and his necromancer mix with sorcerer moveset make him one of the greatest villains on the roster, so much so that they brought him back into MK9 to retcon him into the events of the original trilogy. His only missteps being a few questionable fatalities over the years and getting his butt handed to him on a silver platter in his latest appearance. But nevertheless, Quan Chi is the personification of the Nether Realm and one of Mortal Kombat's 3D era's best villains, outclassing even the Elder God that he served. Your soul is mine. One of Mortal Kombat's other greatest villains is none other than Shang Tsung, the evil sorcerer that is only out for his own gains, even willing to go against Shao Kahn himself. Beginning with the gimmick that he can transform into other characters and steal their moves, he's since evolved into a corny, soul-devouring villain. He teamed up with Quan Chi and was able to finally kill his rival Liu Kang, and with MK11 he almost became the ruler of time and space altogether. I don't think any new character's first appearance made quite the impact as Spawn in MK11. A decorated US soldier, Al Simmons was brutally murdered by his own men and was resurrected by forces of darkness as Hellspawn. He has a glorious design, a cape that holds lots of guns, and uses a fun combination of ranged and bladed weaponry, and his moveset and fatalities are some of the most enjoyable in the game. 
Even his ending, in which he continues to fight demons in hell alongside Sub-Zero and Scorpion, is just an epic end to his tower. The OG female ninja introduced into the series, Katana came with a tragic backstory of her home of Adinia being conquered by Shao Kahn, and Princess Katana being adopted by the evil emperor, forced to serve his side. She also had a striking design and moveset involving bladed fans. She stood out a lot more than Sonya Blade. Much like two certain ninjas, Goro and Liu Kang, Raiden also makes up the face of Mortal Kombat, the straw hat wearing Thunder God who made his first appearance on the first game's roster. Raiden is Earthrealm's protector, using his powers to help the defenders of Earthrealm stand against opposing forces. However, around MK6, they reinvented him as Dark Raiden. He got a little problematic. Dark Raiden was an interesting new take for the character, but it didn't really go anywhere. Then, in the recent trilogy, Raiden has only ever messed things up, complicating the timeline in MK9 and murdering Liu Kang, being corrupted by Shinnok's amulet in MK10, and even in MK11, he's so easily twisted to the dark side. Raiden is synonymous with Mortal Kombat, being one of the franchise's most iconic characters, but for me, he's not in the top 5 due to him being so easily corrupted that it feels a little far why he'd be the one assigned as Earth's Guardian. From Superstar to Special Forces, Johnny Cage had a long history with Mortal Kombat. Originally supposed to be the sole character, portrayed by John claude Van Damme until that idea was scrapped. From the very beginning, Cage was oozing with personality, carrying his iconic shades, executing his split punch move, and in recent years donning a Johnny tattoo across his chest with a Cage belt buckle. From his cheesy but lovable one-liners and throwback jokes, Netherrealm hasn't ever really done Johnny Cage any injustice, and seeing a young, egocentric Johnny meet his older Special Forces self in MK11 was just icing on the cake. Liu Kang is like the lifeblood of Mortal Kombat. It hits its peak when Liu Kang is in it, and falls from its heights when Liu Kang is absent. That's not to say that Liu Kang, for the longest time, was just a fighting game staple, Bruce Lee inspired fighter. And in MK6 and 7, he was a zombie. Thankfully, over the years, his mystical fire moves, his bicycle kicks, and dragon fatality have stood him apart from other stereotypical fighters, and the recent MK trilogy has took the heroic champion in a different direction, breaking away from Raiden's failed teachings and becoming an evil lord of the Netherrealm. Then we got Fire God Liu Kang, and he's rewritten the MK timeline once again but it still feels full circle because it's Liu Kang, the lifeblood of Mortal Kombat and forever will be. Sub-Zero the First, Bihan, or later named Noob Saibot, sits at number 5 for me. This was one of the most mysterious ninjas when he first appeared, a completely void black ninja from head to toe. I'm grateful that his design didn't dramatically change like Reptiles did. Instead, Noob only got more added to his tragic backstory, every appearance that he made. Being the brother to the series' current Sub-Zero, Noob was the one who murdered Scorpion's family and clan. When Scorpion got his revenge, Quan Chi reborn Bihan as the Wraith Noob, always closely followed by his shadow clone, Cybot. This creates a fun dynamic in his moveset where he calls upon Cybot's assistance. MK11 fully embraced this, and it makes him one of the most unique fighters in the franchise. From his mysterious beginnings, fun 3D era team up with Smoke, and his recent story significance with his brother and Scorpion, Noob Cybot is a character who has never been wasted or stumbled in his history with Mortal Kombat, always one of the most strongest standout characters on the roster. Every fighting game series has the heavily sexualized female combatant, 
Mortal Kombat took that idea and thought what if we make her a monster. Being a clone of Katana, but mixed with Takatan genetics, Melina has the body and looks of her sister, but also the ferocious nature, the savagery lust for blood, and the jaws of her Takatan DNA, thus making her almost succubus-like. Melina and Katana are the yin and yang of the series, with Melina always out to replace her sister and become the Empress of Outworld. The tragedy being, when she does, it's always short-lived. Being one of the most developed characters in the franchise with her psychotic nature, her charisma and passion to become more than what she was conceived to be, makes her a fun character and she is always a delight to play as. Melina is a fan favourite and so distinctive from the rest of the female fighters. Without a doubt, Mortal Kombat's most glorious bad guy is none other than the Emperor of Outworld, Shao Kahn. There's a reason Shao Kahn always comes crawling back again and again, there's just no one who can top him. This conqueror of realms is like if a dragon, Conan the Barbarian and a pimp were mixed in a blender. Give him a hammer and a cool helmet to showcase his dominance and he can wreck almost this entire list. His iconic lines of dialogue, his disgusting levels of power, his fantastic playable appearances, Khan is the go-to villain and will forever be a staple character of Mortal Kombat. So the top two spots are like hairs close, in fact they're about as interchangeable as Cyrax and Sector, because they're both fantastic iconic characters, it's just going to be down to personal preference at this point. But for me, second spot goes to Sub-Zero, Kwai Liang was the brother to Bihan and took up his mantle as Sub-Zero after Bihan's death at the hands of Scorpion. This fighter has had many developments over the history of Mortal Kombat, leaving the Lin Kuei due to his disgust of their cyber ninja program, starting up his own clan, becoming a member of the Defenders of Earthrealm, making peace with Sub-Zero, beating Batman and donning his own cape in MK8, taking on the Shredder outfit, Sub-Zero has done it all. But unlike his brother, Sub-Zero was a righteous fighter and carries with him an unforgettable moveset of cool moves and petrifying freezes. And at number one out of the 99 Mortal Kombat characters, it has to be Scorpion, the icon of Mortal Kombat and I cannot deny that. This guy is the ultimate combatant, an honourable Japanese warrior turned spectre, bent on getting revenge and serving justice for the lives that he lost. His iconic kunai on a chain, his signature phrase, get over here, his fiery appearance, ripping off his mask to reveal a skull underneath. There's so much history with Scorpion, so much development, and in every game he is one of my favourites to play as. Mortal Kombat 10 gave his character some final closure, letting Hanzo Hasashi walk the earth once more. And yet he's still the most badass on the roster, the incredible aura around his character will never fade. And so that's been my ranking of all 99 Mortal Kombat characters. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, leave a comment on what your favourite Mortal Kombat characters are to play as, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you all so much for watching, and adios, take care.